welcome to Unforgiven 1992 Review and Thoughts film. Now I start this video with a review with zero spoilers, but as soon as I end the review itself, please note that the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. And I am aware that many people have watched the movie, the review itself will still be based on the idea that you haven't. When a prostitute is attacked by a John who cuts scars into her face, which the movie never loses track of, several times we see the we see the other prostitutes tend to the cuts, and you know the makeup. We never forget that this woman was scarred, and the toll it takes on her psychologically is very clear. She's given a number of medium shots and even some close-ups, you know, where we can very clearly see the pain that she feels, and I've always found it really striking that we can clearly tell she, to some extent, blames herself for what comes after. I'm, I think there's maybe five or six prostitutes, and every single one of them gets at least some screen time and a few lines. However, both the owner of the brothel and the sheriff say that there will be no consequences other than Skinny, who owns the brothel, getting some of the John's horses. Because to both Skinny and Sheriff Little Bill, the crime that was done here was essentially property damage. The prostitute is not perceived as her own person, but the property of the brothel, similar to how, you know, yeah, back then, you know, some, some time ago, a rapist might be forced to marry her victim rather than being kept far away from the victim and facing actual justice. Did I say her victim? I meant his victim, a rapist, his victim, sorry. And in fact, the John attacked her in response to her laughing at him. And he couldn't handle a prostitute, someone to him, the lowest of the low, laughing at him. So the prostitutes promise a thousand dollar reward, which, you know, the movie is set in, I want to say, was it 1880? Back then, that was a lot of money. But yeah, a reward to anyone who will kill the John and his friend who forcibly held the prostitute in place while the other guy was cutting her. And this just might be enough to lure out of retirement two of the most brutal outlaws. Now, this has really excellent writing. The movie does such a great job of exploring the long-term consequences of violence, such as the effect it has on someone's psychology and this includes the perpetrator of the violence. Some say that the movie is slow-paced. I've personally always found it to be deeply gripping because for so much of it, you're terrified what awful, brutal thing someone will do next. I can understand those who say things like the character of English Bob gets too much screen time, too much focus. I would say he makes an invaluable contribution to the movie's themes. But if you think you might find this movie slow, if you find some of the other movies directed by Clint Eastwood to be slow, yeah, you might find the movie to be slow. Now, we don't see... <sighs> Never mind, sorry, that was an outdated note, and sometimes I'm in too much of a hurry, and I forget to read what I say before I say it. The movie starts with violence. The movie starts with the, the cutting of the prostitute, immediately telling us that this is a movie that is going to be about brutal violence. And the ending is just devastating. This, I think this is one of the most effective endings to any movie I've ever seen. Like, top ten. And the movie never loses you along the way, though. Again, I... There are... You know, some people find that English Bob, that that part is overlong, and I have to respectfully disagree with them. 
Now, as far as the characters go, we have two characters who used to be outlaws. Clint Eastwood plays Bill Money, who is said to have been ruthless, and now he struggles to provide food for his children on their pig farm. He hasn't fired a gun in 11 years, and at first he struggles to hit anything. He can barely mount his own horse. This is a far cry from his character in The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, who can shoot the rope off a man about to be hanged while both of them are on their horses. Him and the man about to be hanged. Two separate horses. He says that he has changed, that he isn't violent anymore. And he says this to his kids, to his friends, to other people many times, almost like a mantra. M mantra. That's how, that's the pronunciation I'm going with. As if he's trying to convince himself, along with other people. And he's seen to de-escalate a number of situations and comes across as if he really has turned a new leaf. But we can't help but wonder if the dangerous, mean outlaw is still in there. And Morgan Freeman plays Ned, and he's he also used to be an outlaw, and he is very... He points out to Will some things that Will either hasn't thought about or ideas that he sort of just pushed away. Problems with the idea of the two of them killing these two cowboys for the money. And then there's the Schofield kid, who's like this, this young guy, and he's always boasting about being an outlaw, and he really idolizes Bill Money. We can tell that there's something going on with him. His boasts ring false. And then you have Sheriff Little Bill, played by Gene Hackman. And he's very... Actually, yeah, never mind. I have a few other things I want to get to before I get into his performance. And then there is... I want to say Beauch Beauchamp, who is a biographer for the outlaw English Bob, which allows the movie to comment on how some people may not con commit violence themselves, but they find violence somewhat appealing to hear others talk about detailing how they manage to shoot others and live to tell about it. I, I will say his character can at times it can come across as a little preachy. I'd say it's the only aspect of the film where it feels preachy, even though it definitely... There's there's really no doubt that it very much has this anti-violence message. So you would expect it might get preachy. I feel like Beauchamp, at times, it's a little overdone in, in how... That's honestly... That's the closest thing to a flaw I can find in this movie, and it's really not much of a flaw. This movie has incredible acting. Clint Eastwood applies his well-known talent for implying a lot of pain and a rough past with just his facial expressions. You know, I, I've seen some, you know, call him Squint Eastwood, and the man does squint a lot, but it's very... Throughout the movie, he, there's, there's this, there's a, there's implied pain in his face throughout the movie, but his, he, he goes through some, something of a change over the course of the movie, and you really do feel like, you, you can really tell, like, this is, this is where someone a less experienced actor would not be able to get that much across with just the, the facial expressions. And it is vital that so much of it is the facial expressions because someone like that really doesn't... We, we see that immediately. He doesn't really like to talk about his past. He tries not to think about it too much. And when he thinks about it, he tries to point to it as, you know, thank goodness I'm not that guy anymore. You know, ah, oh, it's the, 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 you know, 
as yeah, as I said at the start of the film, he hasn't fired a shot in uh, was it eleven or twelve years, something like that. His wife died just a few years before the events of the movie, but they were together for ten years, and during that time, he did in fact not. He didn't kill anyone. He didn't go out and get into, like, you know, the, these brutal things that he used to do all the time. And the movie doesn't go into a lot of detail, but it does... I mean, there is this sense that... For example, Ned also has a wife, and she clearly is not happy about the this you know job of of killing these two cowboys the the movie has this sense of the the that that women can be a soothing presence for men that they can you know they they can find a gentle soul deep within men who commit violence, and I've always found that to be very credible, and I don't know, I, I will say it, it might be good if the movie spent a little more time d digging a little bit deeper into that, because it is basically just... Um, the movie states that it happened, that, that once Bill Money married, he was no longer vicious. And, and the, there's nothing in the movie that suggests that that isn't true. When they were together, you know, before it, he was vicious. When they were together, he was much more gentle. And, you know, now that she's been dead for a few years, he is still gentle. He is still trying to make the pig farm work. And we, with, with Ned, it, we don't get a lot of details, but he is married when the movie starts. And the, the, there's a clear sense that his wife does not like the idea of them doing something violent, which, and yeah, I think it is also specifically stated that Ned hasn't shot at a person in years. He shoots animals, but he hasn't shot at a person for years now. And the movie never really goes further into exactly how this, you know, but a lot of the men in the movie are seen to be very vicious and mean-spirited in a number of situations, and it, it is sort of this thing of, it was a very brutal time, not that that excuses anything, but it, a lot of a lot of young men were brutal because of just how rough things were. And the one thing that really seems to be able to, you know, cure a man of being brutal is a good woman. And the movie also, Eastwood very clearly displays that if he has much of an ego, he's not going to let it get in the way of making a better film. And he allowed himself to look very unattractive in several ways. He comes out looking very bad in a number of scenes. And, yeah, it made for a better movie. You know, this, I, I realize that some will say, you know, if he didn't have an ego, he wouldn't star in the movie. He cast someone else. I disagree. I think that he felt that it needed to be someone like him. And it really is perfect that you know, someone who was in so many very traditional westerns, you know, did this movie, which is a revisionist western. Some have called it an anti-western. Now, Morgan Freeman's very matter-of-fact and very, very good at getting to the, the, the core of, of problems. He really doesn't you know, he, he has a very realistic outset and outlook, something like that. And he's not going to 
you know, you, you get the sense that he doesn't want to get caught in a bad situation, so he tries to suss out what are the potential problems here. And, and yeah, finally, you know, Gene Hackman, his character is very clearly trying to be fair and trying to prevent revenge. You know, he doesn't... He clearly doesn't take seriously the, the you know, the pain of the, the... Delilah, the specific prostitute whose face was cut, or the other prostitutes, you know, who call him out and, and say, you know, what these cowboys did was horrible, and, you know, all that's gonna be is this, you know, they, the, the cowboys have to give, give Skinny some horses. But he is, you know, Little Bill is clearly trying to make sure that there is as little violence as possible. He has a strict policy of, you know, he, he's the sheriff of the town of Big Whiskey, and every, you know, anyone who's in his town, if you're not a deputy, you know, the, the sheriff and the deputies are the only ones to carry guns. And there's a, there's a sign at the, you know, right as you enter town that specifically says, you know, the, the nobody but the sheriff and his deputies carry guns here. And if he finds someone is trying to sneak a gun in, you know, he'll he'll ask them, did you see the sign? Because there's a sign, right? You know, maybe you didn't see the sign. It was dark out when you came in. Maybe you didn't see the sign. Do you have a gun? Yes or no? And if they lie to him, if they try to hide the fact that they are armed, yeah, he he might, you know, he will sometimes kick someone repeatedly for trying to sneak a gun in, you know, and obviously that is very, you know, like I said, this is a story about brutal men. That's also brutal, but it is clear that he, you know, he, he could very easily, he could say, if we see someone with a gun, we shoot them and call it self-defense. But he, he, you know, he has, before he disarms someone, he has his deputies all point their guns at that person, greatly decreasing the risk that the other person is going to, actually try to shoot his way out of the situation. You know, that would be, like, he will have, like, six guys all pointing guns directly at the man who has a gun. And Little Bill will calmly try to, yeah, you know, say, you're not allowed to carry guns. Are you carrying a gun? You know, he gives them a chance to come clean and to hand over the gun. Now, the core plot of this movie has been done in many westerns. What this does differently is that it's not a straightforward western. It's a western that's critical of the genre. You'll find many of the tropes from these kinds of movies, but they're not played straight. They're not playing out the way that we're used to. And it is absolutely perfect that it's directed by and starring Clint Eastwood, who appeared in a number of spaghetti westerns, Probably most famously, it's The Man With No Name in the Dollars trilogy. And, you know, I don't mean to come across as though I don't... I love a good Western, you know. And without a doubt, a movie like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly is critical of war and empathetic towards the toll it takes on men. You know, psychological as well as physical. And don't get me wrong, I love those movies. On most days, I could sit down and enjoy those movies. But a lot of old westerns did lead to many people having a very positive outlook on some things that, when you think about it, were, in fact, not only just not good, but they were 
actually harmful regarding treatment of minorities, including women, the casual use of violence, and how well it supposedly works to solve problems. To this day, you have some American conservatives talking about war or revolution or the like as if it's going to be like a traditional Western, you know, the the good guy rides into town, shoots the black hats, you know, rides off into the sunset, and the problems are all solved. And, yeah, this is a movie that, you know, lo looks that point of view straight in the eye and says, you're wrong, and here's why. Excuse me. Clint Eastwood knew the genre, knows the genre, sorry, he's not dead, knows the genre well enough to make a movie like this, where he is completely frank about these things. And the cinematography is, I, I'm not sure it quite gets enough credit for how gorgeous some of these shots are. The, the very first shot is Will burying his wife, and it's this gorgeous, like, he's only seen in silhouette, and you see, like, I'm terrible. I think it's a sunset, not a sunrise, but I always, I'm terrible at just, you know, telling which is which. As this text crawl explains about who he used to be. And actually, you know, the, the, like I said, the movie starts after she has already died. But William Money's wife is, you know, her presence is felt. The, the, it's, it's very clear that William Money does not like that they're going to embark on this violence. But the, the, the pig farm is not working out well. We're told right at the very start that, like, a number of these pigs have a fever. And we see him struggle to, you know, you don't have to know very much about hogs to know that if, yeah, they don't, they don't like being caught, even by people who feed them. And yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna try to run away from you. And he has trouble keeping up, which is completely understandable for his age. You know, I, I forget exactly, I, I want to say he was in his 60s when he did this movie. You know, actually, hold on. Yes, I believe... Yeah, the movie's from 92. I believe he was born in 1930, so he would have been 61 or 62 while making this movie. And that's just not that great of an age to try to keep, all, keep up with hogs. And, you know, like I said, he was with his wife for 10 years. I, I don't know 100%. I would say his youngest, he has two, you know, he has a boy and a girl. And I think the boy is maybe eight, the girl's maybe six. That's not, they can't do very much to help him with the hog. You know, they, they can do a little, but you, at, at their age, they're not quite capable. So, so it looks like he needs to do something. You know, once again, it's, it's one thing if it's just, oh, you know, he just wants money. No, he, you know, at his age, he has to, if he doesn't do something fairly soon, he might leave his children with, you know, with, with almost nothing, you know, he, he might himself end up too old and weak to be able to take care of himself or the children, and yeah, you know, it's not a pretty picture of what happened to orphans in the Wild West, you know. But... Yeah, the, the cinematography throughout is excellent. The, you know, it does a really great job of... It, it, we see these scenes where, you know, I already mentioned we have, like, outlaws coming into town armed, and the sheriff confronts them and is like, you know, I know you have a gun, you know. So part of the way that sounds like a very typical scene from an old Western but the the cinematography does a really great job of not showing it through rose-colored glasses. You know, it, 
it's one thing that the content is at least somewhat different, but if it was filmed in the same way, it was, you know, when you look at classical westerns and spaghetti westerns and such, there is this, you know, once again, I love those movies. I love those genres, but they did tend to film these scenes in a very glorifying kind of way. You know, the, the quite a few, you know, countless people have grown up idolizing, you know, people. I remember when I was a kid, and it was probably Lucky Luke before it was The Man With No Name, but I do, yeah, my father and I watched The, the Man, the, the Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, I don't know, countless times from when I was a child, and, you know, I, I rewatched it just a few days ago, it still holds up, still an amazing movie. But it wasn't, it, you know, yeah, by 92, it was necessary to kind of confront these myths because, again, they, they are harmful in, you know, some of the time. And, yeah, the, the way it's filmed is very matter-of-fact and sometimes ruthlessly honest. And the editing is really good at letting things play out in a natural way when that's what's called for but also being very tense and unflinching when that's what's called for. But yeah, the, the, when, when the, the various scenes, again, you know, the, the typical Western is edited in a way that focuses on how skilled the hero is and, you know, yeah, th th things like that. And yeah, it, it is just here, Sometimes things linger, and the the cutting of the prostitute at the start, it takes much longer than is comfortable, without getting exploitative, exploitative, and you know if eventually the 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 cowboy is prevented from continuing, but it doesn't lead to this cool standoff pistols at dawn kind of thing it just you know it's it's a relief to not you know for for the violence to to have stopped but there is still yeah there's there's no the the like like i said the movie never never forgets that she's she's going to have to live her the rest of her life with these scars back then there was nothing that you know I mean, today, you know, some some stuff can be done, you know, to, to you know, the, there's plastic surgery that can somewhat help, you know, someone who's been, been scarred, depending on some circumstances. But back then, there was nothing, there's nothing that, you know, for, for the rest of her life, and she's, I don't know, maybe 25 or 30 when the movie, you know, I realize people didn't live as, as long back then, but yeah, you know, and she doesn't really have prospects. No one's going to take care of her. So, you know, the, the skinny actually points out, you know, now she's going to have to just, ah, what's it called? I forget if he says tend bar or, or is it just that she cleans up the bar after everyone's gone? Something like that, but. You know, he, he very, yeah, with, without any kind of, he just comes out and says, no one's going to pay good money to have sex with a prostitute who has a cut up face. The movie has very few special effects, and I'm glad because it really would have distracted from the movie. And there are not a ton of stunts, but the ones that are, are very impactful. And... I would say this is the, the best... I'll admit I haven't seen that many other Westerns that are critical of Westerns, but I would say this is the best that I've seen of them. And it's not, 
it's not very frequently very graphically violent movie. There's not a lot of blood or gore, but we do see, you know, yeah, there are, there are scenes of beatings. But but yeah, the I'm I'm very glad because it would, I I believe it would end up detracting and distracting from the movie. There are definitely very graphically violent movies where it worked very well, like Logan, which was heavily inspired by this, but I don't think it would have worked well here. You know, a lot of the time you can really feel the pain of the violence, especially in these sequences of beatings. And the largely implied violence makes a very strong impression. And there are times when you so badly just want the violence to stop in this movie, even though you aren't being shown very much of it. You know, there are situations where you wish that the violence would stop because of the context, the people involved. And again, the you know, the first example of this we see is the very start, the cutting of the prostitute. And, you know, this is one of the only Westerns I have ever watched where there there are no unnamed people gunned down. And when people are shot, it doesn't look cool. Every single person that faces violence in this movie is memorable. It's never, yeah, it's never made to look cool. Instead, shocking. You never take any pleasure from it. There's never any joy to be had in it, unlike many other Westerns, perhaps most. And the tone is dark without quite becoming bleak and... Uh, I think there there is maybe a little brooding, but it never gets to be so much that it's, like, a bad thing. There is a little humor in the movie, and some of it is gallows humor. It helps to make all the darkness bearable, and never makes the movie hard to take seriously. And, yeah, so, you know, it's a very unique movie, and... I would say the, the best thing about the movie is the meditation on violence and the impact it has, even many years down the line. And I would say it's worth watching the movie for at least once to get the, the yeah, the, the meditation. Don't only watch reviews. You experience it for yourself. But yeah, you know, years down the line, at there, there are a couple of times where William Money talks specifically about you know, in, in detail about some of the things that he did, you know, 12, 13 years ago, and he remembers some, you know, he remembers it in such detail. He remembers details that are horrifying, that are going to stick with you. You know, some of the things he says, you, you just, you can't, you can't push it out of your mind. It's just, it's just in there now. Now, let's see. Yeah, and if, you know, yeah, if you aren't already looking at, you know, if, if you watch this movie and you really, yeah, you, you love it, I would say, you know, the acting of Clint Eastwood, Morgan Freeman, and Gene Hackman, you know, you, you see their talent very well here, and yeah, they, they've done many movies where they're, great, so that's well worth checking out, and the direction of Clint Eastwood and the writing of David Webb Peoples is also very well, very worth seeking out. And yeah, I recommend this to people who love the Western genre and excuse me, wants to watch a movie that's willing to criticize them from an honest, good faith perspective made by someone who loves the genre and helped define it. And yeah, I give this a perfect 10 out of 10. I, like I said, I, I can, I really can't think of anything that, that really detracts. Like, like I said, the, the couple of things, the, the, I wish that they went a little bit more into how, you know, the, the, you know, these these women who marry really brutal men can sometimes really tame them, which is, of course, also 
let's not mince words about that is not always the case. Sometimes the the you know the the partners of brutal men face some of the worst of the violence. So you know, please don't think that any you know not not just every man who is brutal can be you know tamed by a good woman, but it is true for some. And let's see, what was the other thing? But yeah, the the they are really not. There, there's almost nothing about this movie that I could criticize. From here on out, this video has spoilers. And that brings us to the second section, which is called Disclaimers. Now, if you don't care about these disclaimers, I'll try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice, the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once I get into the rest of the video itself. And let's see. with that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie will be in this section. And I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. So let's see. Yeah, I am spoiling the movie, but I'm only spoiling this movie. I might bring up examples from other westerns, but I'm either not going to spoil or I will like hold up an index finger while I, you know, yeah, as I'm spoiling, so you can mute and skip ahead to see me lower my index finger again if you want to avoid those spoilers. Now, let's see. Yeah, so content warning and or trigger warning. I have a hard time understanding the distinction, but I do really respect how necessary the terms are, and I want to cover my bases. I am going to be discussing some of the potentially triggering content of this movie, including cutting up someone's face and people talking about them, also having been blinded and, you know, female genital mutilation, child murder, brutal beatings, and revenge. And let's see. I don't have a problem with violence and gore in general. The thing is one of my favorite horror movies and movies in general. I also love Cronenberg's The Fly, Videodrome, etc. Personally, I don't think it's wrong to put violence in fiction except for the following, well, exceptions. If it could encourage xenophobia and if it could make people think that violence is a solution. There are almost no problems that it solves in real life. And that's something I really love about this movie. It very much shows, you know, violence is not a solution. I realize some people think that the ending implies that it is sometimes a solution. I disagree with them on that. And I've, I will get into the ending in the, not the next section, but the section after that, the notes I took before watching. And I don't have a problem with film sexuality, nudity, disturbing and upsetting material in general. Monsters are one of my favorite movies. And let's see. I might swear in this video for those bothered by such. Instead of me quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say here, I love every line they put in the IMDb my little quote section, so you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. Now, let's see. Yeah, the following is a short list supplied by the IMDb more like this list of movies that are similar to this. And yeah, so. Some of these I did not watch. For those, I just won't say a rating, so you'll know. Grand Torino, Million Dollar Baby, For a Few Dollars More, 7 out of 10. Heat, 10 out of 10. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, 9 out of 10. Casino, 8 out of 10. Braveheart, I think I did watch it, but it's been so many years, I do not remember that movie, so I have no idea what rating I would give it. Raging Bull, yes, I know, I will get to it. LA Confidential, 9 out of 10. No Country for Old Men, yes, I'll get to it. There Will Be Blood, 10 out of 10. Die Hard, 8 out of 10. Yeah, sometimes the more like this list is very vaguely 
This is like Die Hard. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure I really see it. Anyway, so yeah, you know my my personal favorite movie that is like this is this. My maybe least favorite movie that is similar to it is Soldier with Kurt Russell. I do think that that one tries, but boy does Paul W. S. Anderson not know how to handle an anti-violence message. And it's too bad because Kurt Russell gives a strong performance and the script, which I think is also David Webb Peoples, is is has has some really great stuff to it. I haven't read the the you know, the original script, so I don't know how much of there there are a couple of issues with it, but that might be stuff that was added by Paul W. Sanderson. Now to give you more now the more of an idea of my exposure to these films. You know, I must have watched at least a few dozen westerns, and not only spaghetti westerns. So I went through, you know, Wikipedia has like, a, a, I, I didn't realize this until recently, but Wikipedia has a section, you know, you can, it, it lists the different types of westerns. So, for the classical western, you know, Magnificent Seven, love that movie. I remember loving One-Eyed Jacks, but I don't remember many details of it right now. For the neo-western, I love the Mariachi Trilogy. The epic western, Once Upon a Time in the West, Dances with Wolves, Django Unchained. For the horror western, From Dusk Till Dawn, John Carpenter's Vampires. For the martial arts western, Shanghai Noon. The sci-fi western, Back to the Future Part 3, and Cowboys and Aliens. Snow Western, that's a thing. The Hateful Eight. Weird Western, that is also a thing. The 1999 Wild Wild West movie. And no, I am not proud that I watched that movie. And for Australian Western, which is also a thing, the first Mad Max movie. And yes, I know I will get to the Mad Max sequels. And yeah, I enjoy most that I've watched. I think the Trinity films or Spaghetti Westerns, yeah, quite enjoyed those. Let me think. The Deadly Companions, I forget which that falls into, but I, I love it. And I rewatched. Let me think. Ah, crap. Now, the uh, titles. Yeah, never mind. I wanted to rewatch the entire Dollars trilogy, but I could not get my hands on a copy of For a Few Dollars More. In the days and weeks leading up to me doing this video, I probably won't talk much about Logan in this video. I said basically everything I want to say in the the video I did videos I did on that movie and when you know when I watched Logan and did videos on it, I had recently rewatched Unforgiven. So, you know, as for comparisons and such, yeah, I said it in that video. Although I think I probably tried to keep it a little vague, or maybe I just said that I was going to bring up Unforgiven. I forget. Now, let's see. So, yeah, the, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. You know, analysis and such, and, yeah. So, the the... Let's see. The 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 section immediately after this one is thought that I, thoughts that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary or live tweeting or the like. The section after that is thoughts that I had before watching, and you know which sometimes instead of talking about something, a, a scene in the movie in the the thoughts that I had while watching section, it'll be in the thoughts that I had before watching section, and it'll be from memory. And yeah, and in the final section I get into stuff I think it is worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, and B and Wikipedia. Now this video is not me saying I'm smarter than you or know more or know better than you. The stuff I say in this video I'm not saying only I could or have thought of it. 
it's just stuff I want to talk about and think others would enjoy listening to. Now, let's see. This is a movie that has empathy for the least likable of the characters, and I think that was the right choice. I mean, probably the least the least likable characters. For some, that's going to be Little Bill. Personally, I think it's either... See, I, I don't... I know that one of them is called Quick Mike. I forget what the other one's called, but the two cowboys. I'm not 100% sure which I find the more repulsive. The one who cut the face or the other one who forcibly held her in place while the other one cut. Instead of trying to talk his friend down from cutting. But, yeah, those, in my opinion, are the two least likable characters. And I will say, I, you know, there's not a ton of empathy for the... Let's see, I think it's the one who cuts... Yeah, you know, the, the other one... Yeah, yeah, that's the guy who gets shot in the, in the bathroom, I think. Yeah. You know, there at the very end, the movie could easily have played him as just, like, cowardly or really pathetic or something. But, no, he comes across as a human being, just he doesn't want to die, you know? And, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that about this movie. Now, let's see, that is... Yeah, so, the, uh, the Western genre, as I already mentioned, does not always treat minorities particularly well. And this movie, I mean, I, I could understand there are probably people who watch this movie and take away from it that the prostitutes are really vicious and, you know, vengeful. I don't think that the movie makes them look bad. I think it's very understandable. You know, I, I don't think that they are disproportionate. I think that it makes a lot of sense that, I mean, okay, obviously, literally, it is disproportionate because it's not a life for a life. It's a life to, you know, in in return, you know, the, the to, to avenge the disfiguring. So it is literally, obviously, disproportionate. But I think it is very understandable. I don't think that, you know, it's not like they say, let's, you know, every, every single cowboy has to die. They say these two specific cowboys should die for what they did. And I don't think that it would have gotten to that if the if Little Bill had listened more, you know, probably at the very least you know, whip the two cowboys, and maybe, like, maybe they give money to the, the prostitutes in return for that. I, I think, you know, something like that, but, yeah. I could understand arguments saying that the movie should not start without us ever seeing, you know, William Money's deceased wife, that that is, you know, taking, you know, that that, that makes, you know, that, that she is a disposable character. I don't quite agree. I, I agree that we don't, we don't see her, we don't hear her voice, there's no flashbacks, nothing, but her presence is very much felt. You know, you, we, we see at the very end just how vicious you know, William Money can be. And up to that point, before, you know, every, you know, yeah, for most of the movie, we see the version of him that has been tamed. And I personally think that really speaks to, you know, I, I think it's a movie that, that treasures women, that, that feel that women really help I mean you I think an argument could be made that if there were no good women 
in the world of Unforgiven, there would be a lot more killings by brutal men. You know, Ned and William Money both stopped killing when they married good women. You know, so... And the, the prostitutes themselves, I really appreciate all that the movie does to humanize them because it could so easily just be, you know, just that the, this, like, uh, what's the word? Like this, excuse me, this, you know, undefined group where, you know, the, they, they come across as individuals, you know, they, they don't always agree on everything, and, yeah, I, I really felt like it makes a lot of sense that Strawberry Alice is able to convince them, you know, one of them points out, Delilah doesn't want the, the cowboys dead, you know, and, and she says, so why should we want them dead, and Strawberry Alice points out, you know, basically, we're we're treated as the lowest of the low. We, you know, no no other people are treated as as worth as little as prostitutes. And you know, she she makes the the comparison. She says, just because we let them ride us like horses doesn't doesn't mean we have to let them brand us like horses. And you know, and and then goes on to say. Ah, I'm not a fan of that word. We may be prostitutes, but at least we ain't horses, you know. And, yeah, so you can understand, you can understand her passion. You can understand how she's able to rile up the others. Because $1,000, that is a lot of money. That was, I, I forget, it's, it's in the trivia, but someone calculated how much money that would be today. And... It's a ton of money. It's like tens of thousands of dollars. So, and and it's all you know. We're we're specifically told having sex with one of these prostitutes is only one dollar. So one thousand. That's that's a lot of money. And I realized that they you know apparently they didn't quite have a thousand. So they you know in in you know in to replace some of that, uh, you know, they have sex with the the kill the assassins of the cowboys, and yeah, you the the movie could very easily fall into the trap of these just being disposable. You know, the the it is necessary for the story that one of the prostitutes was had her face cut, and it's necessary for the story that the prostitutes pool their money so that they can have enough that it'll lure assassins to the town you know the the they they know that it needs to be a lot because you know i mean it takes i when when william money leaves home he says he might not be back for 2 weeks that means that it's going to take him that long to ride out there, kill, and then ride back. You know, that's that's pretty significant. If you're not offered very much, you're not going to make that kind of, you know, yeah. So, so it's necessary for the story to function that you have these attributes of the prostitutes. And some movies would let it end there, would not push for more than that. But they are, I mean, I'm, I couldn't name the prostitutes, um, their, their names are other than Delilah and Strawberry Alice, but the, the, yeah, the, the, every single one of them has at least a few lines and at least a little bit of screen time, which considering, you know, yeah, the movie's over two hours, but... It has a lot of characters to fit in. You know, a lot of the deputies also get personalities. So the fact that it manages to fit in at least a little bit of characterization for every single prostitute, it clearly, you know, both David Webb Peoples in writing the script and Clint Eastwood in directing the movie 
and and his level of control over the editing of the movie you know it was important to to them that the prostitutes have some personality that they not just be you know it's it would be very hypocritical for the movie to treat the prostitutes as not worth very much when it is specifically like you know the the two cowboys clearly don't think the prostitutes are worth very much so that kind of you know the the movie is in part about what that kind of treatment of other people can lead to you know hypothetically like yeah i'll get more into that in the yeah but the the it wasn't necessary for them to do i get it he was insulted he felt you know his his frail ego was you know well, damaged i forget what the phrase is but he didn't have to cut her face that's just you know yeah unbelievably disgusting one of the worst things you can do and i uh, yeah the the prostitute's reaction is very human and ultimately the you know the movie is i mean if uh, an argument could be made that little bill is to some extent the villain of the movie he is the he kills ned and he you know if he had taken the prostitutes seriously and actually done you know the the Excuse me. If he had tried to get a, you know, to to. If he treated the prostitutes more as people, and tried to to. You know, have more empathy for their situation, maybe things wouldn't have gotten so bad. But ultimately, you know. He has this sort of. He he does not he doesn't want people shooting each other. He doesn't want revenge killings. And the the movie there at the end, you know, he it, I don't know if he would phrase it like that, but it seems as though he basically sees it as the the violence begets violence. You know, if you start if if one person kills another person you know person a kills person b as revenge then maybe person b's brother kills person a for revenge and then maybe person a's brother kills the brother of person b you know and it just keeps going you know there there are some places in the world where the the revenge killings get completely out of hand and it's just completely destroys these people and I think Little Bill, that's like his, that's what he's afraid of. He's afraid that his town will become one revenge killing after another. And his belief that violence begets violence, there at the end of the movie, is proven, proven correct, sorry. He is basically proven to be right. He just, his you know, probably his biggest mistake was to under underestimate the pain of these prostitutes. Because just like the the people you know, this this is one of the problems with law enforcement. If the law enforcement thinks that you are not as not worth as much as the people who do you know, who who hurt you, then how likely is it that you that, that they're going to treat you fairly that there's going to be punishment for the people who hurt you I should briefly say I'm not ah what's the word I do believe we need some law enforcement but I do think there's reform is necessary excuse me but you know I do think that is part of the the tragedy of little bill and of the movie is that ultimately he is you know he he didn't want to whip the the two 
it, cat, the two cowboys because he didn't want to cause more violence than absolutely necessary. You know, the, the first time we see him physically beat someone is when that person has killed before and is threatening to kill again. He's saying, you know, if you come here to kill someone, I will beat you and I will send you packing. But because he was so averse to violence at the start of the movie, it ends up, you know, that what he hoped to prevent does actually come true. And that is the thing. Even if you try really hard to prevent violence from spreading, it might still spread, you know. And, and that's the thing. The, the, the prostitutes also believe that you have to, you know, he thinks that if you make an example, if he makes an example out of English Bob by beating him, in public, in front of the whole town. You know, he doesn't... Like, with Ned, he does at least take him into the, the sheriff's office. You know, very few people actually see him beat Ned. But with English Bob, he beats him in front of everyone and says, this is exactly what's going to happen to any assassin who comes to my town. And the prostitutes think, if we get the two cowboys killed, that's going to send... A message if you cut a prostitute here you know you will end up dead so they they do both believe that you know ah crap I used to know the I want to say is that retributive justice is that what it's called rather you know where the the yeah basically like saying justice means if you do, if you hurt, you know, if you punch me 10 times, I punch you 20 times, you know, that, that kind of thing, you know, you, you did this to me, so I get to do it to you or, or pay someone else to do it to you. And we increase it because if I only do to you what you did to me, you might do it back again because I didn't do enough. You know, I didn't go far enough to warn you. And I also really appreciate, you know, the the prostitutes are fairly rarely just, like, sexualized for no reason. I mean, there's, some of them wear revealing outfits, yes, but it's not really, like, think of how many movies like this would have the prostitutes basically, like, seduce the, the you know, the kid and, and Ned. You know, it's not made to be, like, this, you know, incredible, like, yeah, you know, yeah, think of how easily it could have been, like, Catherine Trammell, you know, from Basic Instinct, in case that is a little too vague. The, the, this, this femme, femme fatale just seducing a man in order for him to be willing to use violence to protect her or something, you know. But it isn't. The, they're never... N none of the prostitutes are ever filmed in a way or seen doing something to where it really looks like, you know. I, th I think you do briefly see sex, and it doesn't look sexy at all. Like, yeah, yeah at the start of the movie, if I recall, the, the right before we see the, the cutting... We see one of them, yeah, the other cowboy having sex with one of the prostitutes, and it doesn't look even remotely erotic. Like, there's, it, it just, it's, it's like, um, it's like a mechanical thing almost. It's just the, the, the movements are there, but there's no, like, you know, the, it, it's completely clear that these two people do not love each other. I'm not saying that that's the only time that sex is okay, you know, excuse me, basically the, the way I see it, the only way sex can be wrong is if consent is violated, which obviously includes the, you know, you, you cannot consent if you're not of age and of, uh, what's it called, sound mind, something like that. So the the I'm I'm not saying that there are only you know a few 
cases wherein it is okay. You know, I, I would say I would want these prostitutes to have a chance to have other jobs, and it very much comes across that they do not like, you know, being prostitutes. But I, you know, I would want them to have better working conditions, but I don't think prostitution is inherently wrong. But this movie shows very clearly these are, you know, the, the, what, what is that phrase, the, the happy hooker? There, this is, there is no happy hooker here. You know, none of these are, you know, happy about it. Like, they, they, they have sex with some of the would-be assassins as, an, you know, to, to encourage them, to, to help pay for it. Because they couldn't make a thousand dollars, you know that. How how could they possibly, you know, I I, I don't know one hundred percent, but I assume that, you know, skinny. They they still you know. What they have to spend to to for for like food and such, that you know skinny doesn't cover that. They have to pay that out of what little they make. But the. Excuse me. The the ah, let me think. The yeah, it is it is very clear that excuse me to to these prostitutes, sex is a tool, and it is usually just you know it's it's how they make their money. Now let's see. That pretty well covers. Yes. yes, so. Apologies for the dead air. That brings us to the next section notes taken while watching. The one thing Little Bill asks the prostitutes is whether Delilah will live through it, because that, to him, that's the one thing that matters here. And I think it is fair to assume that if the, you know, if the cuts were to the extent where she wouldn't survive, I think it's fair to assume that he would have, you know, beaten the, the, two cowboys for that, the way that we see that he beats you if you come into town and you don't give up your guns and then pretend you don't have guns. Excuse me. And Skinny brings up to him the girls are property and And yeah, the, the moment that we start seeing Bill Money, we immediately see the trouble he has with dealing with the hogs, and we're told just how many of them have a fever, so it's very clear that he's not going to be able to keep food on the table with this farm. Based on William Money's reputation, the Schofield kid figures that the way to appeal, you know, to impress him is to talk about how he himself has, you know, killed people. You know, like he, he literally says, I haven't killed as many as you have on account of my youth. And let's see. Yeah, you know, he, he doesn't realize that to Will, these kinds of conversations now simply remind him of something he wants to forget. It no longer appeals to him. But the moment that they meet, like, immediately, the kid starts talking about, you killed X, Y, and Z, right? And, ah, uh, you know, my Uncle Pete, he talks about how vicious you were back then. Keeping in mind, what he's been told 
these stories are more than 11 years old by now. These, you know, these are things so, you know, and, and this was a time where a number of people did commit violence. You know, that was how they made a living. And yeah, the, the, what William Money did was still so outlandish that 11 years later, these are, these stories are still, you know, being told about, like, the, the kid says, you don't look like you were that tough, almost as if, like, he's basically, like, trying to call him out, like, saying, prove to me that you're really that tough, because he thinks that that's, that's how that works, you know, you have to constantly boast. You have to prove yourself. You know, again, the you know, eleven or twelve years after the last time William Money shot anyone, immediately the the, you know, the moment he meets this guy, he doesn't even see him before the he before he even sees the kid, he hears the kid talk about how awful he used to be. You know, he doesn't. There's, there, there isn't, what, what he used to be haunts him to this day. He can't escape from it. You know, the, it's, it's this thing of, it doesn't matter how long you do the right thing for, if the wrong thing you did was wrong enough, then people are never going to forget it. I appreciate that. Almost every single person who commits violence, and in the case of Ned, almost commit violence. He hasn't hurt a person in years. Clearly, it takes a toll on them. Even the guy who held down Delilah, though I'm not sure we... I'm Yeah, the, the cowboy who did cut her, I'm not sure we ever see him express feeling guilty or such, but... Or Little Bill. But I think those are... Yeah, I think those are the only two, I suppose you could say English Bob also doesn't feel bad about doing, he feels bad about a ruined reputation more than he feels bad about the violence, although the reputation and the violence are linked, of course. But yeah, like, you know, the cowboy brings the best horse that he owns to give to Delilah to try to make up for his friend cutting her. To him, that's maybe the best thing that he can do for them. This, you know... These horses are his livelihood, and this is the best horse he has. He tells them, this horse is better than the ones I gave Skinny. And he's specific, you know, Skinny is like, okay, fine. I guess you brought three horses instead of only two. And the cowboy's like, no, this is for Delilah. The agreement was that I give you two of my four horses. This one is for Delilah. But to Strawberry Alice, it's basically an insult. It's equivocating a horse to a prostitute. And it is this, I don't, again, I really don't blame them because it is, like, hypothetically, if they take that, if they accept that, they are basically saying that, you know, okay, I guess we're even. You know, your friend cut up Delilah's face, but you gave her a horse. That's, that's the... You know, the the, uh, the the scales of justice are now even again. You know, you don't need more than that. So them refusing it does make a lot of sense. Excuse me. And clearly William Money is trying to be a good father, turning his difficulty at mounting the horse into a moral lesson for his kid, kids not to treat mistreat animals. Sal, I want to say her name was Sally Tutries, gives a very strong but subtle performance. Clearly, she's not happy that Will is there, especially when she sees that he brought a rifle. She doesn't like, you know, his past with Ned. She doesn't want Will bringing Ned back to that. But she, you know, she doesn't seem to put up much of a fight, but she probably feels that that would only make things worse. And... It's not 
it's possible that she's right about that. You know, the a lot of women in that situation choose to be silent. You know, there's a lot of a lot of pieces of culture, a lot of people who will tell women that if you know, if the man is not directly threatening them, or sometimes even if he is, she should be try to be passive and maybe soothe him. That that's how to yeah. Which is obviously no nobody nobody is directly to blame for someone like institutional abuse can can lead to to violence but like if if um it's not your responsibility to talk someone down if that person is you know yeah Un unless there's some sort you know if there's like uh you know mental illness diagnosis or something, you know, but and Ned points out to Will all the issues with his idea and Will starts to leave since Ned seems like he's not gonna help. Ned stands up, walks towards Will, and as the camera tracks back, we you know, right above Ned's head we see his old rifle visually indicating that he is ready to use it again, or so he thinks anyway. It's it's a clever kind of he put it he put the rifle away, but he didn't get rid of it. You know, he didn't like take it apart and throw it out. You know, if you if you hang something on your wall, it maybe means you don't use it constantly. Like if he was constantly shooting people, he'd have it like on his horse or you know on on his back or something but he didn't get rid of it you can understand why people idolize english bob he attracts attention by being tremendously offensive but he has charisma and we see beaumont is nervous to tell english bob that no guns are allowed in big whiskey and the deputy gives English Bob a chance. He asks him for his gun. English Bob looks him right in the eye and lies to his face about having guns. And we see the deputies preparing, and one of them is clearly afraid and worries that little Bill might be as well, further taking apart the myth of the Western gunman with ice in his veins. I love how smooth and cool Beaumont is with the barber. Just like he he like flicks the the you know, a, a coin over to the, the barber and says, keep the change, you know, because he's just like, I'm with English Bob, so I'm, you know, he's this cool, so I'm probably about this cool, because I'm with him. You know, it's just, it's it's kind of funny, because he's, he's, he's smart, but he's not the most, like, when it, when it comes to He's, he's maybe a little naive. He, you know, he believes the things English Bob tells him when, you know, when, once Little Bill starts talking about them, it's like, yeah, this sounds a lot more like that was actually what happened. I really appreciate how smartly Little Bill plays the encounter with English Bob. It's one of these, you know, glorified shootouts where it's, it's sorry, it's not one of these glorified shootouts where it's just about who's quicker to draw and fire. He has half a dozen guns on English Bob, who would, you know, if Bob actually tried to shoot back, it would be completely, like, his odds are just absurd. It would it would be suicide by cop if he, tr if he went for the gun, you know, and Little Bill knows that, and Little Bill probably also knows English Bob well enough to know that that's not gonna happen, because he... He wouldn't want that to happen, obviously. If he thought that was what was going to happen, I could imagine... Yeah, I don't know exactly what, how else he would play it, but I don't think... It really comes across to me as Little Bill does not want anyone to die of anything but old age, basically. 
Not in his town, at least. And Little Bill knows that English Bob carries more than one gun, and English Bob hoped that he would be able to get away with it. And Little Bill calls him on, you know, antagonizing people, talking about assassinating the president on Independence Day. You know, it's just, yeah, English Bob, the, 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 there's that one guy on the, on the train who sees through the situation and he says, I think this is English Bob and he's just waiting for some American to get crazy and touch his gun so that English Bob can shoot him and call the self-defense. And the Schofield kid tries to act tough and so threatens Ned, you know, after, let's see. yeah, sorry, first he's like shooting because, you know, like he, his eyes are not that great and yeah, he couldn't tell that that was William Money riding towards him, you know, and, and he, he says, oh, well, I didn't know you that there would be two of you, so I thought that it must be, you know, but, excuse me, and then once, let's see, yeah, and, and after that, he also threatens Ned, you know, the, the, and, and there's some chance that if not for, you know, William Money de-escalating the situation, Maybe Ned and the kid would have tried shooting each other. And it's all because the kid has no, you know, he, he hasn't actually, he isn't actually an outlaw, as we find out later in the movie. He just has this, his, you know, his head is, is full of myths about outlaws. So he thinks that this is how you're supposed to be. He doesn't realize that he's really only hurting the relationship between him, Bill, and Ned. And it calls the kid on having bad eyesight with the, you know, claiming there's a hawk. And, uh, yeah. Even though Little Bill clearly doesn't believe a word of the book, The Duke of Death, he does read some of it because he knows that he can take apart at least some of the legend of English Bob, which is a significant threat chunk of why English Bob might be a threat. If people don't fear him, if people are laughing at him, he's going to leave and never look back, instead of Little Bill having to deal with him after he releases him. You know, even though he does, like, he, he, English Bob still has cuffs on, and Little Bill, you know, bent his revolver to the part, you know, it's not going to work anymore. And, and tells the, the, what's it called, coachman? To, to, only loosen his cuffs once he's a bit out of there. If English Bob wasn't, you know, if he doesn't do something to really dissuade English Bob, English Bob is going to get another gun and go back, you know. And it, there's some chance that now that he knows that the deputies are going to try to take his gun, maybe he starts shooting the moment that he sees someone he thinks is, that, is a deputy, you know. And I do really appreciate he doesn't little bill only comments on stories about english bob that he knows the truth about he doesn't like talk about well this doesn't sound very realistic he just he's like i was actually there when this happened and here's what actually happened and it yeah it's like yes he starts off by beating english bob but once you know, after the, the very public beating, then he's, you know, yeah, he's talking about all the things that English Bob is claiming about himself not being true. The kid is certain that being an outlaw is all about boasting about how tough they are, and how many they've killed. He's surprised that neither Bill nor Ned will actually, you know, are actually inter interested in talking about all their kills. You know, Ned at first doesn't respond at all, and eventually, you know, like, the kid keeps asking him, how many have you killed? 
and eventually Ned looks at him and says S something along the why, why does that matter? Or, you know, he, he doesn't want to talk about it. And once the kid tries killing even a single person, you know, yeah, that's the, he's, he's really, he, he feels terrible about it. The, and, and yeah, it is very, there are, of course, there are some people who feel that they, excuse me, the, ah, what's the word? There are some people who do take some, some joy in, in hurting people and even killing people and who will talk about it, but a very, I think it is the most common human reaction is to feel really bad and try not to think about it too much. And Little Bill demonstrates to Beauchamp just how unrealistic the myths of the Old West are when it comes to gunplay. And Beauchamp tries to call on, call him on it by asking, well, what if I give the gun to English Bob? And, you know, Bill is like, sure, go ahead. And English Bob almost takes the gun, but doesn't. And he probably figured that the gun would be empty. And he's like, if I grab an empty gun, Little Bill is going to shoot me. And then, you know, you, yeah, you see the defeat in English Bob's face when Little Bill proves the gun was full. But Little Bill does assure him, if he had taken the gun, Little Bill would have killed him. And I think that is very realistic. The, yeah. And William Money gets frustrated with his horse and cusses out his horse, like he said earlier that he didn't do anymore. So when push comes to shove, he still has some of this, you know, outlaw in him. And now that Little Bill is alone with Beauchamp, he starts playing up his own stories, you know, revealing that he himself is not above that kind of thing, although he probably would think he was. And Beauchamp, not knowing that Little Bill is his own carpenter, jokes that he has a terrible carpenter. And Ned goes to sleep with the prostitutes as well as the kid and leaving the bottle of liquor in front of Will and it stands there, you know, in the front of the shot. It, it has this dominating presence in the shot as William tries not to give in to his urge to drink. And that's even, you know, when, when he talks to little Bill, more than I'm not armed, he keeps saying, I'm not drunk. Because to him, that's where, you know, he thinks, you know, to him, it's basically natural. In, you know, to, in, in the mind of little, sorry, in the mind of William Money, if I am not drunk, he thinks to himself, then I am not a threat. So these people surrounding me with guns, I just have to tell them I'm not drunk. I'm not a threat to anyone. But little Bill, you know, he basically, you know, he's like, you have a gun, you're a threat. And little Bill acknowledges maybe money didn't see the sign because of the weather. As much as I don't like Little Bill, I do think that, you know, we see him that he, he asks for an armed person to give over their gun before he himself, before Little Bill starts committing any violence. And in fact, with both English Bob and William Money, and I suppose that is actually interesting, we never do see exactly what he would do if there was someone who was armed and who just gave up the gun, if that would be... But we see that with the prostitutes, the, the two cowboys, you know, as soon as they're not armed, he only, he threatens with a whipping and he finds them horses. But, you know, other than that, yeah, it's, I mean, clearly he has more respect for the cowboys than English Bob or any other assassin, would be assassin. And he... Yeah, he basically thinks if 
sorry. Train of thought, jump the three tracks there. We're left to ponder if, hypothetically, if he faced someone and they gave up their gun, if that would be it. If he would tell the deputies to no longer aim at them and say, enjoy your stay in, Bill Whis in Little Whis. Big Whiskey. There it is. I got there eventually. And, yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm naive. But I like to think that that is basically what would happen. He doesn't really want for there to be violence if it can at all be avoided. You know, he... Let's see. Yeah, he only starts the violence after... With both English Bob and William Money, he only starts the violence after they lie about being armed, which they do after not giving up their gun. I do think that he is legitimately trying to scare off assassins when he beats the people that, you know, refuse to give up their gun, admit that they have a gun. Excuse me. And Ned and the kid leave through the window, and Ned, excuse me, is realistic enough, excuse me, to not try to get Will help, knowing how many guns are drawn on him. You know, the pro one of the prostitutes saw and told him. And the kid is so inexperienced that he doesn't realize that. And after Will rejoins them, he keeps insisting, I mean, the gun, the gun must have jammed, right? And eventually, he believes that Will is nothing but a useless old pig farmer and thinks that, you know, the, the kid and Ned, yeah, should try to kill the cowboys alone. I really appreciate that when, you know, as Will, William Money tries to reassure Delilah, she's the one, you know, she gets a, a full close-up, practically a Sergio Leone close-up, as William Money tries to reassure her and starts to tell her about his wife. Ned can't finish off the cowboy, and afterwards he quits right after, you know, and, and we see that now William Money is actually the one more determined to finish off the job. And Will insists that, you know, he will still give Ned his share of the money after the job is finished. But yeah, you know, the, basically, as far as I understand, Ned aimed directly at the, the the cowboy but he just couldn't bring his you know and and he did pull the trigger but as he was pulling the trigger he couldn't he couldn't help it he he aimed away from the cowboy and you know let's see if he yeah so if he lowered the gun yeah and then he hit the horse and so the horse is now dead and it falls directly on the cowboy's leg and you know, yeah, he shouts out, I think I broke, I think my leg is broken, and that's, yeah, that, that happens. If a, if a, if a horse falls while you're riding it, and it lands on your leg, yeah, that might break your leg. And as, you know, William points out, if, Ned, if we, if we let him crawl over to those rocks, we're not going to get him, and he's going to be waiting for us. You know, we have to finish it off now. And William shoots, and you know the kid is like, I can still hear him yelling. You didn't, you didn't get him. And William just, you know, he doesn't make a big deal out of. It. He just says, I, I got him, you know, because he knows that he, he wounded him so badly that they're not going to be able to save his life. And in fact, if I think that. I feel like I heard somewhere that the, you know, he's, he's like calling for, for them to, you know, he's saying he's so thirsty and that I, I read that that's an indication that he was hit in the, was it the kidney or the liver or something like that. And in fact, it's a terrible idea for him to drink anything, even though his body is crying out for that. And yeah, he's going to die and it's going to take a while. And it's going to be extremely painful and basically, like, the best thing that they could possibly do 
is for one of them to just put him out of his misery because he's not going to live through the, you know, he, he will be dead in a number of hours. He has been hit in a major organ, and back then, they did not have the tools and knowledge that would enable digging the bullet out of there and, you know, stitching him back up and this whole thing. He's going to die, and it's going to take time. It's not going to be one of these, you know, cool shootouts from a more typical Western where just immediately they, they fall and, you know, seemingly dead from the one shot. And Delilah realizes that when Will talked about his wife, he wasn't being completely truthful, and what she may not realize, and we the audience do realize, is he probably just didn't want to tell her that his wife was dead since they just met. He doesn't want to make her sad by you know, so he, he says, I, I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna I don't wanna free one on account of my wife. And when she hears that, she thinks that he, his wife is still alive. And I forget I does she maybe say, so your wife is taking care of the kids or something like that? And yeah, basically, you know, he doesn't want to say, you know, my, my wife is also, you know, he, he doesn't want to upset her. He, he sees a woman and thinks this is, I, I have to protect her. She's, you know, and little Bill whips Ned and calls him on forgetting what lies he told, which is indeed very accurate. If you're beaten enough, you start to forget what you said if it wasn't the truth. Ultimately, we don't see Ned die, and I think that was the right choice. We're told that little Bill just kept hitting him and suddenly Ned died. And I think that is very, like, I think little Bill maybe didn't take into account Ned's age and like, yeah, you know, at, at, after a while, the body just can't keep going if it suffers enough physical strain and that's what happened, you know. And the remaining cowboy makes fun of the others, saying that he needs someone to protect him when he goes to the bathroom. Probably, you know, he, he's, he's embarrassed or insulted at the idea of someone that close to him when he's in the bathroom. And Will and the kid do, in fact, take advantage of that. You know, it is almost like, I mean, he does basically, he doesn't use these exact words, but essentially he's saying, do you really think someone's going to shoot me while I'm in the, while I'm in the bathroom? You know, it, it seems like just, who would do that? That's, you, you can't do that. That's a, that's completely, of course, someone isn't going, you know, if you're in the bathroom, you can't run, you can't sh you can't return fire. So you're just, you know, and, and we do see, you know, when, when the kid opens the, the bathroom door, he actually, you know, we see that the cowboy just does reach out and he does, he can almost reach it, but now that the door is open, from his position, he can't completely reach his gun and the belt there. And, you know, of course he's going to take his belt off when he's going to the bathroom. You know, so, and, and it's, it's this, it's, it's very well constructed because it is a very credible set of circumstances. And, and, and there's even this detail that the kid at first opens the wrong door, you know, and then he just kind of stands there, just like, I thought he, I don't understand, I thought he'd be in here, you know, it's, it's when, in the heat of the moment, you can sometimes kind of freeze up, that's something that happens to a lot of people, the first time they, you know, the kid is staying there thinking, I'm gonna kill someone, this is the first time I kill someone, I gotta, I, you know, I gotta be, I gotta do it right, I gotta be tough, I gotta show the legend William Money that I can do it, and he opens the door, and there's no one there, and he's like, but I, but he, he went in, I, he, he, he went in just, just a little bit ago, didn't he? So, it just, it's, all, all these little details 
that help take apart the myth of the flawless gunman. I really appreciate how much the movie lingers on the kid killing the cowboy. It's not quick. We don't get much relief. It takes its time on the cowboy's fear of his death and the kid, like, the kid is right there, you know, the, the kid has his gun, he's got it aimed directly at the cowboy, the cowboy's right there, he can't, you know, like, hypothetically, let's say the cowboy did reach all the way to grab his gun, he's certain that that's gonna get him killed, so instead, he basically, he's like, he's trying to appeal to his humanity, basically, and he doesn't say that much, but just the look in his eyes, like, his eyes are screaming, I don't want to die. And the kid is looking right, you know, he, like, he basically, he could, he's like, that, that could be me. What if, what if someday I'm in the can and someone comes out and just shoots me? You know, it's, it's an, it's basically an execution. It's an execution without a trial. There's, it's, it's so dehumanizing and it's, yeah, I, I really appreciate that the movie lets that really hit the audience, you know. I think it, you know, I, I sometimes suggest, I think if you're interested in film, I think it is worth trying editing at least a little bit. I think it's worth, I, I don't know for sure, but I can imagine you could probably find the clip of the scene on YouTube. So, you know, download that, get yourself a free editing program and take just the just a little bit I I mean honestly ultimately it's probably maybe 10 seconds it's probably not longer even though it feels it and just edit just trim it down to just be that the kid opens the door sees the eyes and then shoots immediately instead of lingering on it and as he's trying you know I mean, the kid is basically trying to, to fight through the, the little voice in his lizard brain, which is screaming at him, don't do this. This is not right. This is wrong, and you know it. And afterwards, the kid opens up about how he feels about the killing. And we see now that, you know, William is a lot harder and harsher than we've seen him earlier in the movie. He's getting closer to being back to the rotten outlaw that he was, while the kid is basically like, I'm never going to do that again, this is horrible, you know, and, and William says, take, take a drink, you know, he's ba like, th this is, this will help, it, it always helped me, it helped Ned, it'll help you, you know, the, the movie, yeah, the, the, William turning, getting closer to being who he was, helps to really illustrate just how talented, you know, Clint Eastwood is. He's He's been a man of relatively few words and a lot of repressed pain from the very start of the movie, but it's very clear that his attitude is very different now. I suppose, to be fair, he did talk more earlier in the movie, but it's still, you know, he he talks a little bit about the, the pain connected to killing someone and what it does to kill someone and yeah you know he talked about that before he talks about it at this point in the movie but yeah at this point it is like you know where earlier he was talking about it as like reformed man as someone who would never do that again but now he's basically talking about it like that's life that's that's how things are And one of the prostitutes tells William Money about Little Bill beating Ned to death. And, you know, William Money, others have pointed out how nice, subtle detail this is. He takes a few sips of the whiskey bottle. You know, the it was introduced, you know, a couple of scenes ago. And at first, Ned is like, well, you want some of this? And was like, no, no, I don't, I don't drink anymore. My wife cured me of that. G give some to the kid. And, you know, Ned gives some to the kid, and the kid and Ned drink a little, and then, you know, in, in the saloon itself, you know, you have the, the bottle standing there, and, and Will, you know, like, he, I, yeah, I don't think he does take a sip. He, he sits and stares at it a little, and then he, he pushes the, the little 
glass away. And that's also, you know, he tells Little Bill, I'm not drunk. But, yeah, with Ned dead, it, you know, he slowly becomes that again. And by the time, you know, he's, he's drinking as he's riding, and by the time he gets into the town, the bottle is empty. You know, he throws it on the ground and rides on the horse past the empty bottle. And he is William Money, worst outlaw, you know, meaning the best, as the kid puts it. And Will asks the kid for the pistol, and now the kid actually thinks that Will might kill him for the money. Will has spent so much of the movie trying to convince people that that isn't who he is anymore. And he even managed to convince the kid that he wasn't a killer anymore, but now that the kid has killed himself, and knowing that Will has killed a lot of people, he assumes that Will might be ruthless enough to kill the kid, even though they, they've they been working together. You know, no, Will has never said, this, you know, even with all the, the times that, like, the kid literally shot at Will and Ned when he, at the time when he couldn't see it, and where he couldn't tell that it was them, and, you know, the, the he's he's pointed a gun at Ned and all this stuff, but Will never threatened the kid, but now that he asks for the gun, the kid isn't, oh, he's, he's going to kill me. After all this, he's going to kill me. Take the money. I don't, I don't care. I, I'd rather be blind and poor than dead, as he says. And little Bill is in the saloon rewarding the people who are working for him, trying to stop the assassins. And, you know, he says the first two rounds are on him. After that, they have to pay for it themselves. And, you know, don't get too drunk because we do have to ride out tomorrow. But it's okay. We got, you know, we got one of them. That's worth celebrating. And the, you know, the saloon goes quiet gradually as more and more people realize that a man you know pointing a shotgun is you know in the saloon and and you know skinny owns up to you know being the owner and it's a it's a neat little detail i i have to admit i almost missed it but the saloon itself is called Greeley's, and when Skinny says that he owns it, he says, I bought it from Greeley's for $1,000. I think the idea is supposed to be that Skinny doesn't understand, you know, the place being called Greeley's means that it belongs to Greeley. You know, it, you know Greeley apostrophe S. But he thinks that it's called that that the guy was also called Greeley's because he doesn't know enough about proper grammar. You know, it's uh, yeah. But yeah, you know, Skinny says, "I own this place," and William Money says, "You know, cl get clear of him." You know, and everybody knows that he's about to shoot, and several people do walk away, and. Little Bill does try to talk him away, to talk him out of shooting him. Full well knowing that there's some chance that he's going to get shot for interrupting him. You know, if, if a man is willing to, you know, he's, he's about to shoot someone that he doesn't even, like, all, all that William Money knows about Skinny is that he owns this place, you know. So there's some chance that he's going to shoot Little Bill, in, in Little Bill's mind, that he's going to shoot, that William is going to shoot Little Bill for, like, interfering. And he still tries. He still says, hold on now, don't shoot. And when he actually shoots, it, it, again, Gene Hackman, it's, it's, a, it's a very great, it's, it's a very strong and, and sometimes subtle performance because he's clearly like he's he really doesn't want anyone to get shot here and he already clearly is like fired up and intense before anyone gets shot as as soon as he sees the the, the rifle 
the, the shotgun, you know, he's like, okay, stop, calm down. We're gonna, we're gonna try to work, you know, we're gonna figure out what's going on here, and we're not gonna shoot each other. But when he sees this stranger shoot an unarmed man, He's the, you know, it, there's still room for him to take it up a notch. He is, he's infuriated. He's, he, he can barely believe what he's seeing. And honestly, it probably has been many years since he's seen something like that. And there's some chance that it's never happened in his town. You know, as long as he's been sheriff, he's never let something like that happen. But this time he couldn't prevent it. And he... And, and that is the thing. I, I understand those who say that Little Bill isn't trying to be fair, that he's just high off his own authority and power, and he just likes being the one who has the access to the violence. But he clearly does hate seeing an unarmed man be shot like that, you know. And Beauchamp is clearly excited by William Money's threats of violence and carrying out the violence some. And Little Bill gives instructions to his deputies, realizing that he might die, but it might still mean that the others stop William Money. Really excellent. Everything... Excuse me. Every... every detail in the, the showdown in the saloon. You can tell how many of them panic, and that's why they can't hit William. You know, Little Bill told the people in the saloon who William Money was, specifically because he wanted the others to hate him enough to be willing to kill him, but instead they end up fearing him so much that they can't hit him. And it's, it's very nicely, like, you specifically you see how they, they try to aim him, but they just, they can't aim at him, but they just can't, and so they, they fire the gun, they hit, like, the, the serving counter thing instead, you know. And William Money says he's always been lucky when it comes to killing, further demolishing the myth of the incredible gunfighter of the West. I've seen some say that Little Bill is basically John Wayne type, and I, I agree with that. And Eastwood is basically playing what the man with no name or other of Eastwood's characters from Westerns might end up looking like, might end up like years down the line from those movies. So this is how Eastwood demolishing, demolishes the, you know, perhaps the two most idolized of these Western white hat characters. The John Wayne type faces revenge for his brutalizing of black hats. The very last thing that happens to him is a shotgun blast directly to the face. And again, I really appreciate that. I know that there are people who would have wanted to see the, the head just explode. You know, and there are movies from the around that time that would show something, you know, maybe more horror movies than action, or I don't know if you want to call them action movie, but Maybe not this movie as much as the, but still, you know, I really appreciate that we don't see it because it isn't, the fact that we know it happened is the important part. I, I don't, I don't think it's right for, you know, for us to, to see it and just be focusing on the, the gory visual of it. The, the important part is that it's just, I, I mean... It's, it's such a, you know, he even says right before William Money finishes him off, I don't deserve this. I was building a house. You know, he's in, in his mind, this is like, th this can't happen. This is not right. It shouldn't, it, it's, and, and that's the, yeah, that's, that's the thing. This kind of thing does happen if, you know, un under certain circumstances, and it is, you know, it's it's not enough to be a John Wayne type. It that that doesn't always solve the problems. And I'm not going to talk very much about John Wayne. I'm not particularly fond of John Wayne movies, but I'm just going to, yeah. 
I'm not going to start some... I don't want to get into an argument in, in the comments with people. If you love John Wayne movies, that's great. I am not trying to... Anyway, Eastwood's own character, at first, he's a shadow of his former self, and then for a chunk of the movie, we hardly believe that he will ever end up coming, you know, really committing a lot of violence again. But there at the end, he's right back to it, and it pains the audience to see him do it. I love the book ending of the text crawls, both in part about William Money, the first one, you know, and yeah, w William Money and his deceased wife. The first one sets up how William Money used to be and how he's still perceived even by the time his wife dies. She's kept him gentle for over a decade. And then at the very end, it again reminds, of, uh, reminds us of his reputation. But this time, it immediately follows us seeing him live down to his reputation, you know, and, and it's just, it's heartbreaking, that bit about, you know, the, the mother comes, his dead, his deceased wife's mother comes to visit the grave, and by then, William Money is long gone, and you know, it's it says there's there was nothing there to explain to her why her only daughter married a man of such you know notoriously bad temper and just and and it is this thing because to so many people that's all they're ever gonna know of William Money. They're never going to see anything else of him. They're not going to see the 11 years where he didn't commit a violent act. They're only ever going to focus on the violence that he committed both before and after his, his, his the death of his wife. You know, yeah, before meeting, before marrying his wife and after, you know, his wife's death. And, you know, the, the ending suggests, you know, no, he... He didn't keep committing violence. He, what was it? He went to, ah, crap. I, I'm sorry, I forget. But it says he prospered in dry goods, which, if, you, if you're starting off with, okay, wait, one, one second. Yeah, he's got, so he's got like 330. Wait, that, that would be if they got all $1,000. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure how much money he has. Well, let's say he has maybe $300. Yeah, there's some chance that he could make that kind of thing work out. And, that's the that's the thing, you know, he does this so that his kids won't starve, so that his kids won't become orphans. But the only thing that people see is the violence that he commits, which is part of the anti-violence message of the movie, you know. Yeah, when you're watching the movie, you can appreciate that he could be almost cured of, you know, the way I see it, I don't think that he's going to keep committing violence after the events of the movie. But that doesn't mean that the events of the movie aren't going to haunt him still. You know, and it is this thing of, yeah, if if what you do is bad enough, that's all people are ever going to see. You know, it's it's like how there's, you know, the, the, it's... A lot harder to get a job in a number of countries if you've committed a crime, if you've been convicted of a crime. The, you know, a lot of these people, they don't look at, well, why did he do the crime? You know, was he stealing because he was starving? Or did he, like, shoot a homeless man to see what it would feel like? There's, there's kind of a, you know, there, there are different reasons for, you know, and... and Sometimes people do the wrong thing because they really don't have any other choice. And, yeah, to a lot of people, they're just going to look, oh, he's been convicted. Maybe he'll do something again. I don't want to have to deal with that, you know. And, yeah, I, I really appreciate that that is, you know, the, the, the very first thing and the very last thing in the movie is the the love of the of of William Money's wife and how much it changed him and the 
how how his own history will not be forgotten you know everybody yeah the, the the this is what people know about him they they know that he's a dangerous outlaw and yeah and i'm not saying that you shouldn't i mean he he openly admits he's killed women and children that's yeah i i don't I think it's important that we give people a chance to show a, a chance to become better people and a chance to prove that they've become better people. But I, I'm not sure that I'm in favor of just forgetting someone who's, if someone, you know, someone who's killed, but yeah. Now the movie is two hours and a minute long without any credits and two hours five and a half minutes long with end credits. And that brings us to the next section. Notes taken before watching. Now I'm briefly going to talk about some of the other stuff I'm familiar with of the work of, let's see, It really is wild just how different some of the movies that Clint Eastwood has directed, how, how different some of them are from others. Oh, that's right. The Rookie, which, heh, not a great movie. He literally directed that two years before this movie. Yeah, and then in 2000, he directed Space Cowboys. Bloodworth is average, but then something like Mystic River is excellent. Changeling, Invictus, J. Edgar, yeah, immensely talented. And yeah, David Webb Peoples. As of February 2015, Peoples has 13 writing credits 10 for original screenplays, two for stories, one for source material, as well as five credits for editing and three credits for directing. And he wrote Blade Runner, Twelve Monkeys, Soldier, and this. Excuse me. Yeah, unbelievably talented. These are, again, Soldier has issues, but yeah, this Blade Runner and Twelve Monkeys are among the, the best. Yeah. I'm not making any excuse. Yeah, there, there are issues with Blade Runner that... I'm going to direct you to the videos of the pop culture detective. He's done some excellent videos. He, he did, I guess, yeah, one, one excellent video on, oh, every video of his is excellent, but he made a video that is specifically about Harrison Ford. And yeah, I, he says everything that I would say about that one aspect of Blade Runner. So I, rather than just reiterating what he says, I will direct you to his work. And let's see, yeah, so for Gene Hackman, let's see. Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna go into I guess not for Morgan Freeman either. I had actually forgotten Richard Harris. So yeah, he's in Gladiator, Smallest Sense of Snow, and Patriot Games. I vaguely remember. It's just that he's, yeah, I don't know. He's so, so different. It hasn't even been that long since I watched Gladiator. So I vaguely recall, yeah. Now, I am not going to be talking about some of the messed up things that Clint Eastwood has said and some of the messed up movies he's made when it comes to politics. 
Not in this video, at least. I really love that the ending of the film technically has the content, but its tone is very different, that we're used to in many westerns. But where we're usually cheering the cowboy who's gunning down the villains, we just desperately want the money to stop. It's like watching someone you love fall off the wagon after they worked desperately hard for years to become able to stay sober because they finally realized that their alcoholism was ruining their life. And I suppose to an extent that is that is part of what we're watching, yeah. It's like watching a loved one who's a former addict that you thought had successfully kicked the habit go back to using even though last time they ended up having to steal to afford drugs. Every shot fired practically feels like it's hitting us, the audience, with how devastating it is. I wouldn't blame someone in the audience for literally begging William Money to stop, even crying. It's such a powerful scene. Right from when he enters the saloon, there is no thrill, no joy and catharsis in the revenge, neither for the characters nor the audience. It's not a righteous act. It doesn't save the day. It doesn't make things any better. And even though we're used to seeing it in Western, and though it's completely consistent with the movie up to that point, we wouldn't necessarily have guessed that the movie would end like this. Because for so much of it, Bill Money doesn't want to shoot anyone. He's willing to shoot these two guys, in part for the money, and in part he does feel like this prostitute did not deserve being cut. And there's some great character moments in the climax, including that Little Bill doesn't try to go for cover or plead, but instead looks directly at Bill Money, obviously trying to psychologically take away his resolve by not showing any fear. And even in the climax, Bill Money suffers some embarrassment when some th something he used to rely on doesn't go according to plan, when his double barrel shotgun misfires, which does happen sometimes and did back then. And he immediately ducks when shooting, which is something not frequently seen in westerns for the protagonist. I've seen some call it cowardice, others call it strategy. I know military men who would say that one of the most important things to do to, to, to survive being shot at is to duck or throw yourself on the ground to make a smaller target, as small a target for the other person as possible. Now, I disagree with those that say that the ending undercuts the rest of the movie, or that it does make a good case for revenge, for using violence to solve problems. I really shouldn't have to say the following, but I feel like if I don't, someone's going to misunderstand. I'm not saying that you're stupid if that's your read of the movie. I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm saying I disagree. I'm saying we read the scene in two different ways. It is true that Little Bill is not quite a fair lawman. The way I see it, he recognizes that it's an indecent time, and as such, in order for him to be effective, he himself will need to be indecent. He cannot completely stay above the fray. He has to grab the bull by the horns and force it to submit to his will. Hmm, excuse me. <clears throat> excuse me. Hypothetically, if he had not interfered at the start of the movie, those two cowboys would have been killed sooner, and possibly with more collateral damage. I'm not saying that he treated the matter as he should. Clearly, he did not value the prostitutes highly enough that the, you know, as the leader of them would, you know, point out this is unacceptable treatment of human beings. You know, the, the yeah, referring to the cutting and the way Little Bill handles it, I'm not trying to make excuses for people doing wrong things, but I am saying that he clearly was trying, and the movie communicates very effectively there is in actuality fairly little violence in his small town due to his nobody carries guns except me and my deputies zero tolerance policy. I don't read the ending scene as things will be better after this. On the contrary, I can't think of a single character we meet in the movie that I feel would be as principled as Little Bill was. It's possible that they're there and we just don't get to know them, but certainly no one that we meet would be capable of it. Whoever takes over a sheriff isn't going, you know, either they're not going to have the same philosophy as Little Bill, or very likely, you know, maybe they'll have a harsher philosophy. I saw one video review point out that Little Bill acts based on facts. As far as we know, everything that he says about English Bob is completely accurate. Every time you see a reaction shot of Bob, he doesn't look like an honest man who's being lied about. He looks like a sham who's devastated at having been found out. 
little bit of the, doesn't always come to the right conclusion, but I do think it is very clear that he starts by gathering the facts and responding to the facts. In an age when a lot of people were going off emotion, including people with power. I don't think that Little Bill was someone who needed to be stopped. An argument can definitely be made that there are potential sheriffs in that town who would listen to the prostitutes and possibly manage to do a better job at avoiding anyone carrying out acts of revenge. I'm just really not convinced that the people who would make that much better service than Little Bill are going to be the people who get to be sheriff or manage to stay sheriff, you know, after the, you know, after Little Bill is shot like that. All throughout the movie, we see the, that one act of violence begets another. We don't see immediately what will happen from that last act of violence, the killing of the sheriff. But I think it is fair to infer that the next sheriff will be a more ruthless type. He will justify it by saying that he needs to be so, you know, he's so so intense that no one will dare attack him. Every single time someone is killed, there are people who say that they brought it on themselves by the way they behave or what people think of them. Even if a more fair sheriff would be able to temporarily be, you know, able to act in the town, I doubt it would be very long before some of the more ruthless citizens of the town would try to have them replaced, possibly even attack them physically. I realized that Little Bill was working towards retirement, so, you, you know, obviously he wouldn't continue being the sheriff indefinitely. But don't you think that if he retired peacefully and maybe had a hand in guiding the next sheriff, that sheriff would be less reactionary, less of a reactionary violent person than is likely to happen now that Bill Money violently killed the sheriff in front of everyone? You know, a lot of people are going to want one that's more reactionary. It's true that Little Bill is unable to prevent the killing of the two cowboys, but for one thing, he was trying. For another, if several very determined people very badly want to carry something out, it is that much more difficult for someone else to stop them. I don't think there are all that many things that he could have done that he doesn't do to try to protect the two cowboys. I'm not entirely certain that I myself could think of anything that he could have done. He got them bodyguards, he brutalized Bob as a warning to everyone. And let's please remember that Bob wasn't some innocent. What we're told that he did was awful. And it's true that he is the one who kills Ned, and... Let's see... You know, yeah, and ultimately Ned hadn't actually shot the, the cowboy. But then he did shoot a bunch of people years ago. And there is some chance that some of the cowboys, you know, though, though, you know, Ned shoots the horse and then Bill shoots the, the, the cowboy himself. All the other, you know, the, the cowboy's friends there, they might have seen a black man, you know, aiming a rifle firing a shot. Maybe they didn't realize that that shot only killed the horse. I, I suppose if you wanted to point to an innocent who faces violence in the movie, it is the prostitute at the beginning and Skinny, the saloon owner. Basically everybody else, the violence they face is in response. Not always proportionally in response, but a response to some violence that they themselves did. That's also part of the reason that I found the ending to be a scene of such tremendous pain and something I really don't believe will make things any better. As Little Bill points out, the you know Skinny didn't have a gun, hadn't committed physical violence. I agree he should not have, you know, put Ned up in front of the saloon like that. But desecration of a corpse, being met with murder, is horrifying. I really don't believe that the people of the town, many of whom were themselves present, and heard Little Bill talk about what Bill Money had done, and Bill Money admit to it, and realize even if they didn't, didn't themselves see it, if they were looking in another direction, realize that he killed a saloon owner for desecration of a corpse. 
what little thing is the next sheriff going to shoot people over just to make sure he isn't someday going to face Bill Money, uh, Bill Money, not Bill Money literally, but someone just like him, in order to scare people, in order to shoot someone who might shoot him if he doesn't shoot first, which I realize is not something people were thinking about as much in 1992, but today when people talk about reforming the police, one of the things we talk about is that it takes way too little for them before they start using significant force, sometimes lethal force. And part of that is that the training tells them that everyone they encounter is a potential killer. I think there's going to be significantly more violence in that small town after the events of the movie. I think the little Bill, though brutal and clearly not completely fair, was managing to barely restrain the town from erupting into violent revenge killings. This is a town where two cowboys held a prostitute in place and cut up her face in response to her laughing. You know, the cowboy felt his masculinity threatened and decided to assert it by scarring someone else physically permanently. I don't blame the other prostitutes for wanting the two cowboys dead in response. It's not proportional, but neither was the cutting. Like, let's hypothetically try to imagine a scenario where what he did, did wasn't as much of an escalation. Let's imagine that instead of her laughing that she had tried to take a knife to him. In fact, hi, you know, it's a hypothetical. Let's make it completely even. Let's say that before he cut her at all, she had cut him. So he was literally just doing exactly to her, you know, to her what she did to him. If that was what actually happened in the scene with the prostitute and the two cowboys at the start, and the fact that that was exactly what happened was accurately told to other people, Suddenly, there's much less of a drive for revenge. A huge part of the revenge is how disproportionate what the cowboy did to the prostitute was. And it also, like, hypothetically, if, if the scenario had had a cowboy cut, uh, you know, a uh, prostitute cut a cowboy's face, but the prostitute not physically hurt, you know, it, it is a huge part of, you know... Yeah, for the rest of her life, she's going to have those scars, and it's going to be immensely difficult for her to... Excuse me. She's she's probably not going to be able to be a prostitute anymore. Excuse me. Period. And, yeah, you know, the, she's, she's only going to be able to... What was it? Clear the tables or some, something like that, which... I mean, I'm not saying that being a prostitute is a particularly pleasant, you know, for, for quite a few prostitutes, it is not, you know, it's not what they want to do, it's just what they have to do, but it still is, and, and you know, sadly, women are very frequently judged primarily for their physical appearance, so for the rest of her life, she's going to be judged harshly because she has those scars. And literally, all she did was laugh at his penis size. You know, that, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, hypothetically, if the, let me think, ah, never mind. I really appreciate that when William, money enters the saloon and starts killing people, threatening people, and admitting to past misdeeds, we briefly see a young woman, I think it's one of the prostitutes, and she's clearly terrified. She's not relieved that the man meant to avenge the kind of prostitute has arrived. Actually, come to think of it, wasn't that the one who told him? She, like, I think she was the one who rode out and told him, Little Bill killed Ned. Oh, she feels, she thinks it's her fault. She thinks it's her fault that William killed Little Bill. And she's going to live with that guilt for the rest of her life. I really... Sometimes I wish that there was a sequel where we saw how brutal the violence got in the town. Hypothetically, for one thing, imagine that the next sheriff says anybody in town can carry a gun. If somebody else had been carrying a gun, Little Bill wouldn't be dead. And people are going to start seeing William Money's everywhere, you know, just shooting each other over nothing. In part, I wish that there was a sequel like that. But at the same time, I, I feel like it is best left to the audience's imagination. 
yeah, ultimately I feel that it is best. Let yeah. But yeah, you know, the the prostitute is horrified at the reality that has come as a consequence of cowboys cutting up the prostitute. And I suppose some would say it's a consequence of the prostitutes offering a reward, but that makes it sound like they're responsible when their reaction is very understandable. Another thing about the climax, I think it's very reasonable to imagine that in the future, Bill Money will be haunted by this. At some point, he'll hallucinate the people he killed in the saloon, the way he describes hallucinating people he killed earlier in the movie. In general, the movie really does a great job of showing the reality between the various aspects of life in the Old West romanticized by Westerns. We follow three men who are supposed to be incredible shots, who never miss, <coughs> which we've seen in countless Westerns. And then when it comes down to it, Ned can't bring himself to shoot a human being, which ultimately doesn't save him because sometimes violence, you know, hits. One second. Yeah, violence hits people who didn't commit violence. And sometimes violence meant as revenge hit the wrong people who didn't actually do anything. The Schofield kid turns out to not be this incredible outlaw that he keeps bragging about being. In fact, he never killed a person before the events of the movie and he finds he can't ever do it again. He looked directly into the man's eyes and he recognized his humanity. He could imagine himself being on the other end of that gun. And that's the one thing you don't realize if the only movies about killing you watch are ones that glorify it. It is actually extremely difficult for a human being, who is not a sociopath, to intentionally kill another person. And while ultimately Bill Money is capable of killing people, you know, at this sort of movie, he can barely hit a can with a revolver and he can barely mount his horse. And... With Little Bill as the sheriff, it really is the kind of thing where he, as a representative of the state, has monopoly on violence. It's not like he isn't violent towards criminals. It's not that when he's in charge, there is zero violence. And this movie was made when there was less of a public discussion about police brutality, but it is a thought-provoking depiction. Clearly, he's trying to intimidate criminals and display force to reassure citizens that he's sufficiently tough on crime which is what some brutal cops are thinking or say to justify their actions. Now, let's see. Yeah, and, you know, when I rewatched A Fistful of Dollars, I made the following note, and it's not true only of this, um, of A Fistful of Dollars, it's also true of a number of other Westerns. A lone gunfighter comes into a small town shoots outlaws that the sheriff can't touch, fighting for civilians that the sheriff won't help. So, very similar setup to this. And, yeah, when, when Bill Money and Ned and the kid are all in a position to shoot one of the cowboys with a rifle, we see that Ned simply can't bring himself to do it because shooting a human being is not the same thing. A shooting a bird. It's not enough to be great with the rifle. You literally have to look directly at the person you're shooting through a scope. It's right in your face. You have to do this horrible act that will have consequences. And ultimately, William Money does kill the cowboy in that situation. But the movie does something that the traditional Western doesn't do when it's the protagonist killing someone that he himself has no personal relationship with, no personal reason for revenge on. It makes the death take a long time. The kid says that he didn't actually kill him, to which Will asserts that he did. It'll just take longer, because that's something the movies for a long time just didn't really show. But something people who had been in war and the like <clears throat> did know, do know. There are a lot of different places on the human body that if you shoot or stab or hit really hard with a blunt object, it will be deadly, but a lot of them, it's not going to kill immediately. And the person dying will feel how his body struggles to stay alive until he finally dies. Struggles to alert the, the like something that 
we don't think about when you know if you die slowly your your body is going to send a lot of you know what's it called like signals of pain to the brain basically trying to trying to convince it you have to do something or we're we're going to end up dying and this can keep going even when there's nothing the person can do or anyone can do that will make that that will save their life and you know him lying there like we we don't see it for sure and that's again i really appreciate that so much of the movie is suggestion there's a pretty good chance that at some point lying there he realized he fully accepted that he's going to die and that's not that's that's something some people underestimate how much it hurts if to if if you don't want to die and this was this was a young guy you know he's maybe 20 or something ah, excuse me <clears throat> to realize that you're going to die I quite like the element that every time what the two cowboys did to the prostitute is retold, it's been made much worse than before, including blinding her, committing female genital mutilation. The desire for revenge burning in everyone retelling it drives them to exaggerate the story, even from what they themselves have been told. I realize that anyone who heard an exaggerated version obviously is very likely to include things that they don't no, are exaggerations because they only heard the exaggerated versions. But yeah, you know, pretty quickly it goes to including blinding and female genital mutilation. <clears throat> Which I really appreciate that the movie itself is very, you know, we're told that the, that did not actually happen. Not that, you know, what what the cowboy did was bad enough, but yeah. I really appreciate the detail that the Schofield kid makes a very poor outlaw long before we realize that he hasn't killed and in fact is deeply uncomfortable with killing. When Ned and William Money ride towards him, because of his bad eyesight, he starts shooting at them. If he had hit them, you know, he would have wounded, perhaps even killed his allies in the cause, and then later to prove to Ned that he can hit, he shoots one of the, he shoots Ned's canteen. Excuse me. Which is extremely necessary to make, you know, to make it all the way on the long ride through the hot desert. It's not like they can just pull over somewhere and get something to drink. A scene that always really gets to me is when William Money and Delilah talk, and he says that he's not interested in sex, and she thinks that he's saying that because of her appearance. And I really appreciate that he does pretty quickly try to reassure her. And he also clarifies, you know, when when he said we're we, you know, we're, we're we look the same. I didn't mean that you're ugly like me. I meant that we both have scars. Now, let's see. I guess, rather than just quoting this video, yeah, I will direct you to the video entitled How Unforgiven Ended the Western Temporarily. It's well worth watching. And let's see. And the video, A Closer Look at Unforgiven, A History of Violence, is also quite good. I actually subscribed to that channel based on that video. And yeah, so... But yeah, so I found two trailers, one that's two minutes, one that's two and a half, 
The two minute trailer is good, although it does kind of make it look like an action movie, which is very much not the case. And the two and a half minute trailer, it's good, but then, I don't know, I found some of the music near the end to be a little weird, but yeah. And I watched Eastwood Direct's documentary film. Ah, wait one second. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Eastwood directs documentary filmmakers claims for Unforgiven Warner Brothers Entertainment. And yeah, it's an hour and a minute and a half, but it's worth the yeah. And why our heroes are different now, God of War, the Last Jedi Logan, Wise Crank Edition. Do note that it spoils God of War and yeah, God of War, Last Jedi, Logan, in addition to this movie. And Unforgiven Review Retrospective by Jan Man Chronicles. Excellent video. I subscribe based on the video. And let's see. <clears throat> right, and then there's Outlaw Vern's review of the movie. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm gonna... It's it's well worth reading his review. And... Let's see... Just skimming his comment section. forgot this section got this long. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Final section. Critic sites, MDB, and Wikipedia. This is quite a good, this is a reviewer's quote. Unforgiven is a stark western in slow motion, obsessed with reflection, not action. I'm just going to skim through the various Okay, so one of these critics says that individual scenes work, but, oh, hold on, I'll find the, the movie seems overstuffed and halting. I noted to make sure to, this time, see if I felt like that was the case. I still really don't. It's, yeah, I, I wouldn't. You know, 
but I, I get it. I just, I think that more like, I'm, I'm not saying anybody's wrong or watching a movie wrong or something. I hate when people say that. But I think the movie is maybe just not for you if you find it too long. <clears throat> Apologies for the dead air. I forget what this is from, but I'm just going to read this quote. Nothing is neat and nice. The sheriff is hardly any better than the killers, roughing up any who defy his rules, even unwittingly, and he isn't above killing to make clear who is the law. Dying has lost all nobility. In the spaghetti western, most people conveniently die with a shot or two, and this one cowboy gets it in the gut, causing a prolonged, anguished death struggle. See, I think the movie easily could be over long if the, you know, for example, if it lingered on, you know, it, it could spend a lot of time on the, the, you know, yeah, us watching the cowboy dying from his injury or maybe we see like when we see that when that scene starts ned shoots the the horse and then we you know we don't s spend time seeing you know will and ned get to a good place to, to for you know get to a vantage point get ready to shoot wait for the cowboys to get there wait for the shot to get i i really excuse me i really feel like it does a, a great job using the the time and yeah so this is the imdb trivia and i think you know for those who don't read that you know the final screen credit reads dedicated to sergio and don referring to clint eastwood's mentors sergio leone and don siegel that's very and i i don't think i've watched enough don siegel to to speak on him but sergio leone I could imagine, considering how he depicted the Civil War in The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, I could imagine that he... I don't... Ah, crap. I... What was the... Yeah, I think I, I, think I looked it up, and Sergio Leone died before this movie came out, so he didn't live to see it. I'd like to think that he might have appreciated the anti-violence message.
here it is. With inflation, the $1,000 bounty on the Cowboys would be the equivalent of $110,000 now. At a very liberal estimate, more conservative estimate, would be around $30,000. That is enough to start a new life. That's, yeah. For, for you know, back then. For, for the kinds of things. You know, today you might still have, but yeah. Jeremy Irons was considered for the role of English Bob. I could see that. I could totally see that. I, I've seen stuff from the 90s that he was in, such as the third Die Hard movie. Yeah, he could definitely have pulled off English Bob. Now, let's see. Favorite movie of actor and director Bill Duke. That's really cool. This, yeah, this is still IMDb trivia. In the shootout in Greeley's, William Money, Clint Eastwood, fires all six bullet from the, bullets from the Schofield kids, Schofield, when he tells the rest of the men to clear out the back. He's threatening them with an empty gun. I have to admit, I I didn't completely pick up on that when I, when I just from watching, but that's a really good detail. Throughout the movie, William Money continually declines to drink alcohol when it is offered to him or made readily available to him. When he first learns of Ned Logan's death death at the hands of Little Bill. He immediately begins drinking whiskey and continues to do so until, ironically, he leaves Big Whiskey. According to the script, once the final events of Greeley's unfold, Will is depicted as shaking and then having the same difficulty mounting his horse as in the beginning. As we see in the film, however, Will retains his old skills en route, en route to Big Whiskey. Once he learns that Ned has been beaten to death, he finally gives in and begins to drink. By the time he walks into Greeley's, he has attained full realization of his former self. He has no problem mounting his horse and his resolution is firm. And I think that is the right way to play it. When English Bob departs, cursing at the town, he speaks with a rough Cockney accent, implying that Bob's refined upper crust persona was fake. That's a really good, yeah. And the, yeah, I briefly wanted to comment on, in the memorable quote section, uh, yeah, I'm just going to read out the quote before I comment on it, that is. Little Bill says, haven't you seen enough blood for one night? Hell, Alice, it's not like they was tramps or loafers or bad men, just two hard-working boys that was foolish. If they was given over to a wickedness in a regular way, he sounds just like a judge today saying, you look just like my kid to a young white male rapist instead of finding him guilty and punishing him when the evidence is clearly in favor of him being guilty.
And yeah, I also wanted to add, you know, the, the reason William Money survives the, you know, the, the saloon shootout is his past. The fact that these deputies are scared of him based on that. We even see one, you know, one of them try, like, he's, he's too scared to fire his rifle at Bill even when they're outside and he has a good, he has a clear shot. Will can't shoot back, be, you know, in time. He can't possibly shoot before he himself gets shot. But the deputy is too scared. And so he says, okay, fine, if you're so eager to have him shot, why don't you shoot him? And the other guy's like, no, I'm no, I'm not a deputy. I think that does a really good job of, you know, yeah. It, if if you're of, if you're very scared, it's extremely difficult to fire a gun at someone. I mean, even if you aren't scared, it's difficult. And yeah, just you know, basically all of them they want they want Bill Money stopped, but none of them are have it in themselves to. Um, to be the one to shoot. Okay. Yeah. That, that is everything. So... Oh, those are all of my prepared notes. I think I've said everything I wanted to say. I wanted to highlight what I, I saw that someone had said that basically everyone is, you know, almost no one is completely right. Almost every major character is at least a little bit in the wrong in this. And let's see. Um, I'm not sure if I didn't sleep enough or slept too much. I think probably too much. Anyway, let's see. The the um, yeah. I, I believe that is absolutely everything. I, I really, yeah, just, yeah, real quickly, I really appreciate that the movie could so easily make, you know, the w William Money, Ned, the kid, out to be evil, make Little Bill out to be evil, but clearly all of them, there is some, like, and they believe that the you know little bill believes that he is that this is the way to keep law and order the let's see and, and you know william and ned believe that the believes that I guess, yeah, and including the kid, you know, and in part they, they believe, you know, they, they feel that, you know, they, they kind of need that money. They, they have things they need to, you know, and in part also feel like, you know, if you cut some, if you cut a prostitute, you deserve to die, you know. So it is just, no one is just greedy. No one is just evil, which... I've seen quite a few westerns where it is just it comes down to the bad guys are evil and or greedy and the you know they have to be stopped and the good guy stops them and that's it you know and yeah now I think that is everything so yes 
I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.